In a plane with nothing but bushes, Kim Soho, or rather, Lloyd Frontera, observes with his pets and his loyal servant a vast sea of money. Digging his shovel into the ground, Lloyd activates his ability, turning that vast plane into a cluster of future buildings. This is the story of a civil engineer who completely changed the medieval world. But before that, let's go back a few years. You have been randomly chosen by the absolute being as a candidate. From now on, you will be a character in the novel. Knights of Blood and Iron. This was the message Kim Soho received as soon as he opened his eyes. Instantly, he realizes he has ended up in the fantasy world of the novel he read the night before but is confused because he woke up on the ground. He gets up, freezing, his mouth paralyzed from sleeping on the road. The system mocks him, leaving him stressed and making Lloyd try to hit it. Regaining consciousness, he knows he has possessed someone from the novel. But the only person who sleeps on the street and lives in the rural area is the young Master Lloyd. His bodyguard, who was searching everywhere, finally finds him. He is none other than the protagonist of the novel, Javier Azrahan. The protagonist recognizes him immediately, as he looks exactly like the illustrations in the novel. In the novel, Javier's reputation as a swordsman spread throughout the continent, but initially, he is just an anonymous knight who works in the countryside. When the protagonist finds out he is the vagabond Lloyd, he becomes extremely irritated. Seeing this, Javier says he never called him a vagabond, but is glad he has self-awareness. Back at his family's mansion, Javier is warming the fireplace, asking if Lloyd really can't remember what happened. Apparently, he drank until he was completely drunk, destroyed the bar, managed to get back home on pure instinct but ended up fainting on the way. The protagonist, freezing, observes the ground. Although it's warm, the environment is still very cold, as expected in a fantasy medieval world. Before leaving, Javier says he will report the bar incident to Lloyd's father and is questioned by the protagonist about his family's debts. He knows the whole story from the novel, having read it in one night in his apartment. He also knows Lloyd's family's fate. The Baron and Baroness were killed by scammers, and vagabond Lloyd died vomiting blood. The protagonist is furious at how Lloyd has been living until now. It's even worse than his past life in Korea. The next day, his mother asks if he really destroyed things at the bar last night, and asks him to apologize to the owner this time. The protagonist thinks the body owner should apologize since he didn't do anything, but still says he will apologize. His words truly scare them both. They never imagined he would apologize to anyone. In the city, a man working with Hay sees Lloyd and his guard walking through town, so scared of him that he hides behind the cart. In fact, this happens to everyone in town, even children are instructed not to make eye contact with him. His mere presence disgusts the villagers, but this is something he already knows. He wonders why Javier is following him. Javier says the Lord asked him to prevent any accidents from happening again. In short, he's there to protect the villagers from Lloyd. The protagonist wonders if he should try to clean up his image first, but the more urgent matter is to make a lot of money to settle the family's debts so he can enjoy a good life. He checks the system for any hacks he can use, but only finds two useless abilities. Javier asks where Lloyd is going since they are already in front of the bar. The protagonist says he got distracted and didn't realize they had arrived. But Javier is still very suspicious of his actions and suspects he is lying. As the protagonist enters the bar, Javier thinks he's different from the night before, as if he's become someone else. Inside the bar, we see that Lloyd indeed caused a mess the night before. He apologizes, but it only puts the bar owner on high alert. Seeing that the bar owner is scared because he's speaking formally, he tries to be a bit more arrogant, but it seems his apology didn't work very well. Outside, Javier says it's normal for the bar owner not to accept his apologies, since he destroyed all his furniture and decorations that took so long to acquire. He says the bar owner will only be satisfied after receiving compensation, but the protagonist has several family debts to settle. Javier continues, saying the bar owner's mother's condition has worsened due to the winter cold. But this gives the protagonist a brilliant idea. As if a light bulb had finally lit up in his head, he remembers that there's no concept of heated stone slab floors here. If he could make one in this world, it would definitely sell well. This is something Lloyd could never do, but with Kim Soho's knowledge, it would be possible. In Korea, he studied civil engineering and even managed to build a house while in the army. Excited about the new idea, 
he tells Javier he'll go back to the bar, but as he's returning, he receives a notification from the system saying his real journey has begun, and now he had RP points to earn from people. At first, he doesn't quite understand what it means and imagines it must be similar to XP. However, unlike XP, he doesn't gain it by killing monsters but by improving his relationship with characters, so he takes the opportunity to test how it works on Javier. His impression level with him is at minus 30, finding this number very low. He tries to compliment him by saying he's handsome, but this only makes the impression even more unfavorable, now at minus 31. He decides to set this aside for now to avoid irritating him, and proceeds to the bar. At the bar, Lloyd is trying to make a contract with the owner. The contract states that he will build something to pay for the cost of all the items he broke. The owner obviously becomes wary and suspicious of his actions, even using a mental barrier ability against the protagonist. Since his reputation is completely destroyed, he can't simply try to transform into someone else to redeem himself. Instead, he uses his reputation as a vagabond to make the bar owner sign the contract. Now with the contract in hand, Lloyd says it was an excellent choice to negotiate with him, while his bodyguard looks at him with suspicion of his actions. Outside in the bar's yard, he's measuring the site with a shovel. Javier asks if he's trying to establish a new pattern of misconduct, since he threatened the bar owner to sign the contract. The protagonist says he's judging him based on what he did in the past, but now things are different, he will make them smile in the end. He starts digging and thinks that the reason for their smiles will be the foundation of his future money. He begins digging a hole and flattening it, hitting it several times to make it smooth, then he constructs the house structure using wood from the mansion's warehouse. A week later, the foundation of the house is almost ready. He just has to use the red clay by the river to create the exterior. However, he's not an inexhaustible machine. His body is still physically weak. Javier is truly impressed that he is keeping his part of the contract with the bar owner. Even though he's exhausted, the protagonist says he has no time to rest and continues his work. He prepares to cut the wood but is stopped by Javier who takes the axe from his hand and asks what needs to be done. He tosses the wooden planks into the air and quickly cuts them into perfect shapes. The protagonist is impressed, giving him a thumbs up. This is expected from someone about to become a sword master, and he compares it to modern equipment. He boldly asks Javier to help him dig, which obviously annoys him since instead of thanking him, he's asking him to work more. But the protagonist convinces him, saying that if they finish quickly, he'll be able to satisfy his curiosity about what he's doing. With no other choice but to help him finish faster, Javier starts working with the protagonist, and shortly after, they complete the house. He questions him about the symbol on the plaque, but the protagonist says it's his logo. Then he calls him to check what kind of problem he caused, lighting the fireplace, and calling the bar owner and his mother. Both seem to love the warm room. The old woman says she feels like her joints are loosening, while the bar owner wonders how he did it. The protagonist thinks it's normal for people in this world to be surprised by this. It's the power of the Andal floor technique, a Korean method for heating rooms. Javier is impressed, seeing that he really managed to make the two smile. Even though he still doubts Lloyd's intentions, it's undeniable that because of him, two people are happy. Javier's impressions of the protagonist increased by two points earning him 36 RP points. The protagonist even jokes a bit with his bodyguard, saying he was probably thinking, how could trash like this think of that? Even though he spent a bit to build this house, it doesn't matter, as this model house will be the showcase of his new money source. A few days later, people were lining up to experience the sauna. Those coming out all sweaty only made those who hadn't entered yet more curious about it. The protagonist takes this opportunity to try to sell his idea. He created two different plans, Type A, which is a separate construction, and Type B, which remodels the existing house floor, also offering a 10% discount if they buy both constructions. While the protagonist is using his cunning to sell the contracts, his father appears, asking what he's doing. The protagonist becomes apprehensive when he sees him, and already in the mansion, they are having dinner facing each other at the table. It's not like he's avoiding him but it would be problematic if he forbade him from working on the constructions. His father decides to listen to what he has to say and asks what he is plotting this time. 
He tries to act as Lloyd would and says that the only thing he did was build a heated room for the bar owner. Although his father already knows about the contract he made with him and warns that lying and deceiving the population will not be tolerated. The protagonist says that's not what he's doing and asks to leave, but his father asks if he's worried about the family's situation. He continues to say not to worry, that he will overcome this situation immediately, and asks him not to stray from the right path. The protagonist remembers that in his past life, he also heard these words from his father. At the time, he thought everything was fine, but it was all a lie. As he leaves, he tells his father not to give up and to keep going strong. Those were the words he should have said to his father back then. While walking through the corridors thinking about the requests he received, two lone sharks pass by him without even greeting him. In the Baron's room, they say he has five days until the deadline, and if he continues not paying, they won't stand still. The protagonist, who was eavesdropping behind the door, thinks this is the perfect time to appear. He remembers receiving some RP when Javier's impression increased and found out he could use them to level up his skills. A sensor scans him completely, analyzing all the skills he possesses. The system says he's smarter than he seems, and the protagonist, angry, says it's obvious since he was a high-achieving scholarship student. The two skills he acquired based on his current knowledge were basic measurement and basic design. Even though he doesn't quite know what they mean, he buys both. Basic measurement is activated, and his eyes begin to glow green. As soon as he looks outside, he can calculate the land area simply with his eyes. The design skill creates a screen in front of him capable of drawing models quickly, much more useful than doing it on paper, for example. Even though the work will definitely become easier from now on, there's still a construction problem since he doesn't have enough manpower, and he thinks that having a backhoe or heavy machine would make things much easier. The system says it's possible to summon one, making the protagonist quite excited, but it costs 50 RP to summon a random fantasy species, and he only has one. Still, that's great since if fantasy species are as he imagines, they will probably be more useful than heavy machines. Back to the lone sharks, they are threatening the Baron that if he doesn't have enough money to pay, they might end up taking his wife and made to be sold. However, at that moment, the protagonist arrives, asking if they have no manners just because they are lone sharks. They ask why a child is interfering in adult conversations, but before they ask him to leave, the protagonist asks for their invitation letter. In the Kingdom's Noble Law, in Article 3, Section 6, it says that all nobles have the right to protect their rights and interests and entering a noble's mansion without an invitation is equivalent to invasion. The lone sharks say they've never heard of this law, but he tells them to check it together and calls Javier. As soon as he enters the room, the protagonist orders to cut off the invader's arms. The lone sharks ask if he's crazy and if he plans to resolve this in court. Then he says that's why he told them to check together. He wants to see which side the court will take. Seeing Javier unsheathe his sword, the two lone sharks get scared and flee saying they will regret this. His father questions him scared, saying this won't help calm the situation, until Lloyd throws a bag of money on his table. He says that's the initial payment he received and that it's a considerable amount for this month. His father thinks he's extorting money from people, but Javier tells him not to worry since he's monitoring the young master to keep his promise. Seeing that Javier trusts his son, he allows himself to trust him this time. In the corridors, Javier asks how he knows about the law, as he always thought he was an ignorant person, but the protagonist, angry, replies that he found it around. In fact, he found it in the novel. After the couple's death, the lone sharks wanted to dig and take the bodies to sell. At that moment, Javier talks about the law and cuts off the heads of the two. Knowing the novel's content is beneficial, but in any case, one message catches his attention now. He gained 60 RP as his father's trust increased. He goes to a secluded area away from people and activates the random spin. Several gears start floating in the air, forming a magic circle, but it's smaller than he imagined. From this circle, a small mouse comes out, falling to the ground. Seeing that tiny mouse, the protagonist thinks his summoning was a failure, making the poor mouse cry. It manages to communicate, saying that it's not a failure and can do many things. The protagonist asks what it can do, so it spits out a manual. Despite finding it grosses, the protagonist takes the drool-covered manual and discovers that besides being cute, they can have their constitution altered by feeding them sunflower seeds. 
Red seeds make them giant for 12 hours, while blue ones make them small. He asks if it can become as big as a human, since hamsters are good diggers. If it were human-sized, it would be really useful. When he feeds it, the hamster starts glowing and growing. It grows so much and so quickly that it ends up colliding with the protagonist, throwing him a bit away. The hamster, which could fit in his palm before, must now be over 10 meters tall. Besides, it has the digging ability, able to quickly dig through the ground. It can also harden the ground by rolling over it and can store plenty of things in its mouth. The protagonist is happy because the heavy machinery problem is solved, but he can't just show up with these giant creatures since people might get suspicious. So, he will carry a book with him all the time and claim to be a summoning genius. The next day, Lloyd is instructing the workers with his slogans. He makes everyone repeat with him. Safety first. The army of 30 people is clearly demotivated for work, even though they are still paid even if they don't work. The protagonist wonders why the Baron didn't fire them before, but this works better for him since there won't be additional labor costs. To try to motivate them, the protagonist gives a motivational speech, pointing at a handful of dirt, saying he spent the night digging it up and they should take it to the constructions. In reality, it was Padong who did it in 30 minutes. But even with a speech, they are still not motivated at all. He even thinks it's a normal reaction since people don't like to work. Then he is interrupted by the senior knight, Nauman, who asks what he just ordered his troops to do. This man appearing there was something he expected. There are three knights living on this property, Newman, Bayern, and Javier. In the beginning of the novel, Bayern and Javier remained loyal until the property collapsed. But this man in front of him was the first to betray the Baron. Lloyd asks what he's doing, and he says he can't believe he's giving his soldiers dirty work. And as the head of the knights, he can't accept that. The protagonist says he got approval from the Lord, but he insists on talking about the past and that the protagonist must be using the soldiers for personal purposes. Lloyd asks if he wants a beating, and just with that, the guy gets quite stressed. He then makes the first move by throwing sand in his face. Everyone who sees that is shocked, while the guard asks if he really just tried to tarnish his reputation as a knight. The protagonist pretends he didn't hear what he said, then challenges him to a duel right away. Returning to the mansion, Javier asks if he has confidence in defeating Newman. His opponent has a man of heart and is also known as a sword specialist. While the protagonist is just a wretch, how could he even think of winning against him? Javier gets irritated with Lloyd teasing him, almost cutting him with his sword. He tries to analyze his actions, but everything he is doing is very strange. After picking his nose, he asks Javier to teach him swordsmanship. Javier says he would never teach his swordsmanship to someone like him, as someone with bad character like him could use it against people around him. The protagonist knew he wouldn't teach his swordsmanship right away, so he proposes to cure his insomnia. Javier wonders how he knows that, as if he's answering him in his head. The protagonist says he read it in the novel. In the novel, the ranking of the knights is divided into four levels. Javier's level is expert swordsman, and he will soon rise to the highest level, master swordsman. And the reason he can't sleep is that his nerves are superhuman. He agrees to the contract with Lloyd, but he will only teach swordsmanship if he can make him sleep, and says that he has already tried several ways to cure his insomnia, from cognitive behavioral therapy, herbal remedies, aromatic therapy. Even after saying all that, in a few minutes, he was already sleeping like a baby, hugging his pillow. The method the protagonist used to make him sleep is the same as teachers do in the classroom. He talked so much that at some point he just fell asleep. Now that he has fulfilled his part of the deal, all his sword techniques will be his. The next day, Javier, now refreshed from having a good night's sleep, tells the protagonist to start training with 50 laps. And surprisingly, he starts running without complaining. He completes one lap and says he hates doing it, but by the second lap, he totally changes and says he surely didn't expect him to do it without complaining. By the third lap, he unmasks his plan, saying he would say something like, you don't have talent for this, and ignore the training. While he's being totally annoying to Javier, he gains a skill that asks him to hit himself, but he tells the system to discard it. It would be a lie to say he's not tired, but this is nothing compared to his past life. He had no family and woke up alone every day. At work, he carried bricks up to the fourth floor of a building every day, and at night, he unloaded trucks. All this just to survive, 
hoping that one day it would get better. Compared to that pain and despair, this is nothing. Seeing that determination and sincerity, Javier decides to teach him his sword technique. In the mansion, Newman talks to the Baron. He is disappointed that his son dared to insult someone who has protected his family for so long. He had hoped that he was becoming more rational, but it seems he was mistaken. He says it's his duty not to cancel the duel but asks him not to hurt him so much since he's still the heir to the estate. Newman says he accepts his request, but his true intentions are entirely different. He plans to kill him in the fight, and if the Baron complains, he will kill him and his wife and make it look like suicide, all as he had planned. One month later, the long-awaited battle begins. The Baron and the Baroness, with their servants, watch anxiously. Newman asks if the protagonist is prepared. He, carrying only a shovel, says he should be prepared to take a beating. Everyone watching the fight from outside wonders if he's really going to fight with a shovel. Javier says he personally asked the blacksmith to forge it. His father is deeply disappointed, thinking he's playing around with a serious situation. But Javier, who has been following what he's been doing for the past month, doubts that he's just fooling around. Early in the morning, he did the basic training without complaining, then he went to the construction area to teach the residents about Andal, and then practiced swordsmanship until falling asleep at night. Someone who dedicated himself so much for a month couldn't be just fooling around. Javier is sure he's taking the fight seriously. The Baron initiates the duel between them, and the protagonist starts the combat with a pretty mediocre stance. Newman, who was already pissed off with him, is the first to attack but has his first attack defended. Both his father and Javier are impressed that he managed to defend an attack, and it wasn't just luck, since he continues to defend all the subsequent attacks. Javier is impressed with the extraordinary efficiency of his movements. It's like a sword technique evolved over many years. In fact, it's called modern combat, bayonet charge, something every Korean man learns in the army. Even using the shovel as a weapon wasn't random, since in addition to being able to use the shovel to defend himself, he can also use it to attack. For this combat, the protagonist came 100% prepared, first preparing the shovel, second, the basic sword technique, and finally, a tool synchronization ability for excavation. He managed to buy this ability thanks to Javier and his parents. Then, Newman shows why he is a Baron's Knight. He starts accelerating the state of his own mana using his mana heart. He truly prepares to attack this time, advancing almost instantly towards the protagonist. Even Javier says it's impossible for an ordinary person to block an attack from someone who has a mana heart. That's if he were an ordinary person, of course. Even though he attacked with all his strength, aiming to kill, the protagonist manages to block the sword. Newman is confused, feeling as if his body had sunk. This was the fourth ability he prepared, Azrahan's core technique, the technique that made Javier the strongest man in the novel. He realizes that his attack's mana was absorbed, immediately pulling out his sword, but the protagonist takes advantage of this opening to land a blow on his face. The impact is so great that he sees one of his teeth flying, and then he is hit by another attack. Everyone around is shocked. Lloyd really managed to win. His father ends the duel, but this isn't enough to quench Lloyd's anger. He continues to beat him while he's on the ground. His father gets angry, telling him to stop trying to tarnish the knight's honor. As some of the soldiers try to stop him, saying that the duel is over, the other knight from the family remarks that he's out of control. Lloyd claims to have calmed down, and asks the soldiers to release him, only to hit him again immediately afterward. Javier, who is observing more closely, notices that he's hitting only in places that would cause almost no wounds, and the calm expression on his face indicates that he already knew this would happen. Fifteen days before the duel, the protagonist came asking him to teach the mental technique Azrahan. This startles Javier, since this technique was created by him and supposedly no one else should know it. He confirms if this technique can attract mana from the surroundings and convert it into one's own. Javier asks how he knows the technique, but the protagonist shamelessly lies, saying he talked about it in his sleep. Javier says he can't teach the technique because it's still incomplete, but the protagonist claims he can complete it. He explains that if he absorbs external mana and puts it in the mana heart, the mana heart will simply reject it and explode it out as they don't mix. He should concentrate it separately, and then move it around the mana heart. 
Javier thinks this might really be possible and asks how he came up with it, but the protagonist continues to brazenly say he just imagined it would work. That day, Javier was able to complete the technique he had been worrying about for so long, and on the first try, he managed to create three circles. Lloyd says he doesn't want to create a mana heart. All he wants to learn is the absorption part. He just wants to absorb what he can touch. Since he had learned this ability, Javier thought he could defeat Newman, but he triumphantly won. His father again tells him to stop, talking about his reputation as a knight, but he tells him to look under the tablecloth, and then say if this man deserves to be called a knight. He finds several letters, and when he reads their contents, everything is there. From the property's situation to the Baron's likes and dislikes and instructions on how to forge fake documents, these letters contain everything he has shared so far. Newman wonders how he found them since he had hidden them inside the wall, but due to the novel, he already knew where they were and sent his hamster to fetch them. He sees that his father is completely shocked. In the novel, he was described as a kind man, but this protagonist doesn't know the words kind and friendly. He suggests a way to get rid of this man. He proposes throwing fierce rats on his head and then banishing him from the properties or reducing him to a normal knight and giving him a chance to think about his sins. People are confused about why he wants to throw rats at him, since a measly rat wouldn't be able to hurt Newman. Both his father and the people around think it's a sensible and generous suggestion, albeit understandably dangerous. His father agrees to the punishment and asks if Newman has any objections to it. He obviously doesn't, and thanks for their mercy. If you treat an evildoer well, will they really reflect on their sins and return the given mercy? Or will they become even more determined to manipulate and figure out how to take advantage of that kindness? The protagonist says it's great to see his final smile, gives a red sunflower seed for his pet to eat, and says there's no best method to ask for forgiveness. The rat thrown into the air grows to a colossal size, falling on top of Newman, probably killing him. With this, the rotten apple of his lands has just fallen. The next day, his hamster digs a path in the middle of the city. Javier asks what he's doing, and Lloyd replies that he's preparing the way to build a road. The engineering unit, previously shy and unwilling to work, has now become surprisingly efficient. He mentions that in ancient times there was a city called Rome, where people loved roads and even created a road system called the Appian Way. He wants to build something similar, a road that stretches from the Baron's house to the eastern coast. Javier questions again why he's building a road, but the protagonist tells him to just watch quietly and see the rising popularity of roads. However, everything seems very strange to Javier, so he asks where he suddenly learned to do all this. He asks if he's really his young master Lloyd. When the protagonist saw this guy's personality in the novel, he knew something like this could happen. He's the kind of person who would notice the change and immediately draw his sword. He starts using his Lloyd persona, claiming he studied without anyone knowing, and when questioned, since he only lived on alcohol, he says that Javier didn't watch him all day and couldn't know if he was studying or not. He asks how he explains the summoning, as it would be difficult for mages even with 20 years of experience. So the protagonist retorts by asking how he manages to use mana so well at 20 years old, and says that if he's a genius, why couldn't he be one too? Unable to refute his words, Javier just stays silent, so the protagonist seizes the moment to flee and get out of there as fast as possible. He goes to Knight Bayer and asks him to take care of everything while he's away. Javier says he'll accompany him, as it's his duty to watch over the young master, but the protagonist questions why he's stating something so obvious. Javier asks where they are going, and he replies that they are going to a distant place to collect unpaid debts. In a small, remote town in the Rue Nia property, the scammer from Thor to real estate is very stressed because he lost a lot of money. His bodyguard says it's normal since he makes money by gambling, and also says that if he doesn't have enough money to pay him, he'll have to leave. The scammer gets scared, saying he can still pay and that he shouldn't go anywhere. He can make money by cheating others again. But since many people are looking for him, it's better to lay low for now. At that moment, the protagonist kicks the bar door open. The man asks what's wrong with him, but when the protagonist introduces himself as Lloyd Frontera, the guy is shocked as if seeing a ghost. The scammer immediately tells his bodyguard to run with him, and with just one leap, he jumps through the bar window. However, when he reaches the alley, a man is already waiting for him. 
Javier orders him to surrender the scammer and leave. If he refuses, he will be considered an accomplice. The bodyguard won't give up so easily, and as he prepares a spell, he asks if he even knows how to use a sword. The protagonist, observing the fight through the broken window, says that when Javier lost the Baron, he sought revenge and then fought this bodyguard, the first evil black mage he encountered. He had to fight against gravity power, at least that's how it is in the novel. The black mage then uses his gravity magic, directing it towards Javier. He manages to defend using his sword, but the magic expands and creates a gravitational field around him. The black mage then activates the gravity, causing him to break the ground with his feet. When Javier fought this guy in the novel, he was just an expert swordsman, but now this Javier has three mana circles and easily manages to cut the gravity magic. Seeing that it will be impossible to confront him directly, the black mage flees, saying that wasn't part of the contract. Javier asks if he knows what happens if he strikes a noble, intending to cut his legs, so he will crawl to the tribunal. However, at the last second, the scammer is saved by Lloyd, who steps in the middle of the attack and prevents it from landing. He shouts at Javier, saying he will be punished with death if he goes to the tribunal. Javier is shocked. Lloyd just showed kindness to another person. They tie up and lock the swindler in the room. Seeing him quite apprehensive, the protagonist tells him not to be so afraid since he won't kill him. After all, if he did, the people he owes money to would cause a mess. The swindler asks if the protagonist will forgive him, and Lloyd replies that he won't take it to the tribunal, but he expects compensation in money. But since he doesn't have money to pay, the protagonist has another way to forgive him. All he has to do is sign this contract, and that's it. The swindler asks what kind of contract it is. It's just an ordinary worker's contract, and he will be paid, of course. But 80% of his salary will go to repayments due to the high debt, to be paid after 520 years. This shocks both the swindler and Javier. It was obvious that he wasn't there just to sympathize and forgive. The protagonist thinks he'd never be crazy enough to kill a guy who owes him. He'll suck every drop of money he can for the rest of his life. The swindler asks how he can make such an unfair contract, but when the protagonist threatens to take it to the tribunal, he ends up signing the contract right away. Back in the cart on the way to town, we see the swindler still tied up. Javier mentions that due to this guy's money, they won't have to worry about interest for a few months. However, the protagonist corrects him, saying he'll use all that money to invest in labor costs since the 30 soldiers aren't enough. A few days later, we see the protagonist recruiting employees. The line is so long that it extends for several meters. He asks Javier if these people really hate him. He's sure they do, but due to selling the Diendal for a lower price and being firm in punishing the traitor, people have started to see him as trustworthy and capable. The man in front of him asks where to sign the contract but thanks him first since his son used to get very cold in winter. But thanks to him, he doesn't have to worry about that this year. The protagonist even feels ashamed, as he's only satisfying his greed. The man continues, saying he has relatives from another town who would like to buy the Andals. The protagonist expected this to happen, since he didn't build the Andal for nothing. Now he'll raise the price under the pretext of travel expenses and make all the money from them. Up in the mountains, Lloyd tells Javier that one day this mountain will be entirely bare because the Andal consumes a lot of resources. The trees here won't last long. That's why he's cancelling the construction of the Appian Way. At the end of the road, there's a reserve of bituminous coal. They'll extract and sell it for a high price. If the Andal gains a high level of approval, other countries won't be able to resist. Of course, the people in their town will get a discount, but just a little. Lloyd asks if he finds this unfair, but he says if he doesn't do it, he won't be able to pay off the family's debts. Javier agrees with this, but mining there is impossible as it already collapsed once. Still, he says he can do it because he knows modern era excavation technology. He will use the shield method. Javier has no idea what the shield method means but says he'll continue to observe this completely different young master. However, even the protagonist who read the novel doesn't know everything. In this world, there are hidden dangers, and within the cave are thousands of creatures just waiting to emerge. Lloyd clasps his hands and performs magic, casting it upward and summoning a high-level apartment. A huge building appears from the sky, falling behind him. At least that's what he would like to do, but the only magic he uses is on his finger to design faster. 
tired because this project is taking too long. He thinks he would like to summon 100 undead workers who don't need a salary. Due to the incident with Newman, he gains 639 reputation points due to favorable impressions from people. He upgraded his basic design skills and basic measurement skills to intermediate level, gaining new functions. Arriving at the mine entrance, he reflects on how he's supposed to dig there. He activates his intermediate measurement skill and can scan up to 5 meters. With this ability, he can find the safest path, but the problem is how to unearth the entrance quickly. Humans will take too long and get tired easily and Padong is sick of the road project. He sees no other choice but to randomly draw a new species. He activates the mini portal again, which makes quite a noise, and a mini snake comes out of it. Seeing this cute snake, it seems apparently useless on the outside, but he remembers that was the case with Padong too, and asks if it grows big with sunflower seeds. He asks her to demonstrate her skills, and weeks later, he sees that she is much more useful than he imagined. She can eat the earth in front of the shield equipment, then she digests the food, and at that moment, Javier prepares for the attacks. She excretes steel, and Javier is in charge of cutting them, which are then used to build the terrain's support structure. Javier questions why he's cutting the poop of a giant snake, but the protagonist doesn't care and orders everyone to move forward, pushing the iron shield. Even though he installed oxygen tubes, he still feels a bit dizzy, but if it weren't for them, he would have probably passed out inside. Seeing that he's starting to get tired, Javier tells him that he also needs to rest with the other workers, but the protagonist says he's the site manager and needs to oversee the operation and act responsibly. In Korea, the people in charge of the work were the kind of people who didn't even show up on site. He hated those people and promises never to be like them. So, he uses his ability and detects luminous coal ahead. He cheers everyone up, saying they're almost there, and thanks the little snake because thanks to her, they were able to do this 10 times faster. While the protagonist explains that after they reach the coal, they'll have to dismantle the shields and expand the space, they start hearing a noise coming from the ground. Alarmed, the protagonist uses his ability and sees a small hole that wasn't there before, and this hole begins to grow larger until a giant ant emerges from it. Javier immediately cuts its antennae, and Lloyd uses his shovel to crush its head. The sudden appearance of this monster surprised him since it's something that didn't appear in the novel. But this is not the time to relax because an ant never walks alone. Thousands of ants begin to appear, and the protagonist evacuates everyone outside, while Javier manages to hold several of them, cutting them into pieces. If there's an ant colony, there can be from 200 to 1000 monsters there. Javier is running out of breath. He won't be able to hold them all, and the path they made is so well structured that it won't collapse unless they use dynamite. The situation seems very complicated, so Javier slaps Lloyd's face to snap him out of it and not panic. Who is thinking incessantly for a solution, comes up with another brilliant idea. He tells Javier that they will attack head-on and enter the ant tunnel, even though he thinks it's absurd. There must be some reason behind it, so they proceed. At the mansion, the Baron receives the news that monsters have invaded the mine and that his son and Javier stayed behind. He quickly puts on his armor set and tells them to go immediately to the mine. Meanwhile, Javier continues fighting the ants and asks how much more they have to face. The two are completely surrounded by the ants. The protagonist knows that Javier is reaching his limit. He uses his ability to locate methane gas somewhere underground, knowing that if they can find it, they can create a large-scale explosion to deal with the ants. He manages to locate it and starts digging to unearth the methane gas, with Javier protecting him. Things seem to be going well, but they both hear a very loud scream. The ant queen has decided to show up, and just by seeing her size, Javier says he can't face her. However, in this situation, he has no choice but to push beyond his limits, managing to defend against and counterattack the queen's assault. While Javier fights her, the protagonist continues digging until he finally uncovers the gas. He tells Javier to get out of there as fast as possible and run to the entrance while he grabs a still-burning torch. They run through the tunnel filled with dead and bodies, and when they finally put enough distance, he throws the flaming torch towards the gas outlet. The Ant Queen tries to attack them but is hit by the massive explosion caused by the gas. Not only her, but all the ants in the cave are caught in the blast. 
Outside, people hear the noise and a great tremor from deep inside the cave. The Baron worries about his son and tries to enter the cave but is stopped by his bodyguard. Inside, the two survive the explosion, but Javier and the snake have fainted. To make matters worse, the entrance is blocked. Realizing they will soon run out of oxygen, the protagonist uses his ability to see through the wall. He sees no other option but to start digging. Javier, who managed to keep some consciousness, sees him working to get them out, and as a result, he builds a stronger bond with him. Seeing that he has nothing more to lose, he asks the system to enhance his abilities. The system reanalyzes the abilities he possesses, combining all these skills to create the core technique Azrahan. When the ability is created, he feels immense power coursing through his body. Even though he doesn't have a mana core, he can feel the mana circulating around his core. His mana increase went up to 120%, and now he has plenty of RP to spend, so he keeps increasing it until his technique reaches level 10. When it reaches level 10, it evolves, and he starts feeling two mana circles circulating around his heart. Now his mana increase is at 200%, and he also gains two new abilities, one that prevents fatigue for 10 minutes, and another that triples his mana for 20 minutes. He activates his fatigue preventing ability and begins digging tirelessly towards the exit. After digging deep into the excavation, he finally sees a hole indicating the way out, but he is still 5 meters away. He doesn't give up and keeps digging until he reaches 3 meters away, but his oxygen runs out and he falls to his knees, exhausted. Then he activates his other ability, power extension, and continues to hold on firmly to the excavation, but its limit is 20 seconds, which is not enough time for him to reach the exit. Already feeling hopeless, he thinks that as the son of a noble in a remote area, he just wanted to live a quiet life. Unfortunately, he is about to die after exerting so much effort. When he was about to accept his fate, Padong appears, making a small hole. This small hole is enough for him to breathe and regain his strength. Even though he is tired, he still gets up, clinging to the hope that a peaceful life as a noble awaits him just ahead. Inside the cave, the Baron's group explores it, even the deep parts, in search of the two, until he sees his son carrying Javier on his back, who surpassed the limits of his own body, was able to create a third ability that allowed him to endure until there. Seeing that he has finally achieved his goal, the protagonist faints, being embraced by his father. The next day, people in the city talk about what happened. Those who thought Lloyd was just a spoiled brat are impressed by his determination and courage to stay there, fighting against the ants and rescuing all the workers. Back in his room, Lloyd sleeps under Javier's watchful eye. As soon as he opens his eyes, the system's message saying that people are impressed with his courage and heroism appears in front of him. He quickly becomes a hero and gains 500 RP for it, which makes him very happy, of course. The next day, the workers are even more motivated in mining, and when they see Lloyd arriving, everyone starts greeting him and thanking him for saving them. They now see him as the person who saved their lives and think he's different from other nobles. Two weeks have passed since the incident, and even though nothing has happened, the protagonist still decides to prioritize safety and conduct sweeps around the mine. Javier asks why he's personally doing these dangerous things when he could just send one of the workers. But the protagonist calls him an idiot. He should be responsible for the dangerous tasks, so they won't say anything even if he spends a lot of money. They reach the end of the tunnel, and Javier tells them to go back. But the protagonist seems to have seen something with his ability. He starts digging to investigate, as there might be an eggs that haven't hatched yet. But what he finds is something unexpected, an orc trapped along with several other animals, probably stored to be eaten later. Javier says he looks dangerous and intends to take care of him right away, but he's stopped by the protagonist. Lloyd asks if he's dead, but Javier says ants have a habit of only paralyzing what they're going to eat. The MC gives a wicked smile, and says this is an incredible reward. Back at the mansion, the orc is already awake. His name is Hirosh, and he says he will never forget him as his savior. Hirosh, the son of the orc tribe leader, says he will do anything for Lloyd for being his savior. In fact, that was the exact reason he helped the green one. Our prota asks for 120 orc workers to help at the mine, but his request is denied by the orc. As orcs are warriors, only other warriors can give them orders. And since young Lloyd is not a warrior, he couldn't give orders to the orcs even if they provided workers. In the orc tribe, 
It's necessary to bring the head of a monster ant when one becomes an adult. Hiroshi made a mistake in the tunnel and ended up being paralyzed. But of course, RMC wouldn't let this opportunity pass so easily. Before anything else, he congratulates him for becoming an adult orc. Hiroshi, crestfallen, says he couldn't catch a monster ant. So the protagonist says they caught the ant queen together, showing her head pinned to the wall. The Hulk says he doesn't remember catching such a big ant. But the liar says it was a truly surprising sight because when he entered the ant tunnel, the queen was trembling with fear. While Javier listens to his disgusting lie, the orc believes that they are both excellent warriors and that they together caught the queen. Lloyd mentions the 120 workers again, but this time the orc says he will recruit them. A week later, in the Steel Sand Tribe village, the protagonist, who had made a long trip there, finds out that the orc leader refuses his request. Shocked, he asks why. The orc chief says they need to hunt every day, and if they don't eat protein right after the hunt, they will lose muscle strength. Javier says these orcs are bodybuilding maniacs, so it will be impossible to convince them. The protagonist asks if there was a way to preserve the meat so they could go without hunting for more than three days, and he says he knows how to prevent the meat from spoiling even after several days. Let's go back a little in time to remember the moment they arrived in the village. The father and son, who hadn't seen each other for so many days, were extremely emotional to see each other again. They run to each other and give a tight hug. The impact of the hug alone was so strong that it caused a gust of wind to spread around. Lloyd says that if anyone had been between those two, they would have turned into minced meat. Our mercenary thinks that if they can get 120 workers with these two, productivity will increase hundreds of times. But that wasn't the only thing that caught his attention. When Hiroshi brought the Ant Queen's head as a celebration, the orcs were using massive gold objects for squats. Lloyd is shocked and wonders where they found those. It's as if they stole or took them from somewhere. Because of this, he makes a deal with the orc tribe leader to get both the labor force and the treasures. Javier is reading the contract and discovers that they will build a stone-cold storage warehouse. Not knowing what that means, he asks Lloyd. The royal family preserves food using ice magic. What they are going to do is similar, but they won't use magic. To make it, they will need a special stone called granite. It is a very resistant stone and will be difficult to extract. Normally, one would use dynamite to extract the stones, but right next to him is a human dynamo. From Javier's look, he already knows he will use him again. In one of the main episodes of the story, in the city of Namrum, the entire population was trapped in a magic barrier and within this city were thousands of refugees that Javier needed to save. At this moment, Javier was a sword master with four cores spinning around his mana heart. At this moment of despair, he unintentionally created a skill. The explosion from the collision was so strong that, aside from destroying the magic barrier, it became one of his main techniques. Lloyd explains this technique that he could use. Javier again asks how he knows about this. But the protagonist says he just thought of it at some point. Even though the real reason he taught him this technique was to use him, it would still be a great strength boost if he could execute it. Protecting the mana heart with one core and moving the other three, he releases an explosion into the rock. It was so strong that it tore through all his clothes and even ruffled his hair. Angry, Javier asks if he knew that would happen, but Lloyd says he had no idea and apologizes. Anyway, the idea worked, now it's his turn to work. Javier speaks of his knight's honor, and that now he's being used for construction, but the MC realizes that this is just his way of showing gratitude. After this, the construction proceeded rapidly. The granite Javier cut was carried by Padam. The orcs who were addicted to training started working on their own. Because of this help, they will be able to finish five times faster, and the last thing they will need is the ice and thermal insulation. Lloyd asks Javier where the people with the insulating material are. He replies that it's been exactly three weeks, and the group should have arrived by now. There are two possibilities, either the soldiers are lazy, or there was an accident. The protagonist says they must check immediately. Javier stops him and says that if this is a mission, he should do it alone since he doesn't know what kind of accident happened, it could be dangerous. But Lloyd has explained this several times. He is in charge of construction and responsible for the workers' lives. Exploring further into the mountains, he ends up finding one of the gloves he had custom made to use when handling insulating materials. Javier warns that he senses a strange energy coming toward the canyon, an abnormal flow of mana but very faint. Thinking about it, 
He tries to remember if he saw something similar in any of the novel's episodes, but something leaves him completely terrified. He immediately says there's no time, and they need to walk quickly, as everyone might be dead. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on upcoming videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed it and share with your friends. See you in the next video. Bye for now.